Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this this week is Bob Nickel. Welcome, Bob. Uh, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> welcome here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, unlike most of my interviews, uh, interviewees, I know very little about Bob because this was set up very spur of the moment um, by his friend Mark, who uh, was organizing things for him. And Mark, Mark explained to me that Bob has cancer and is going to be undergoing chemo and maybe radiation also pretty soon and won't be in feeling much like doing an interview. Uh, so we kind of bumped you to the head of the queue and I haven't had the chance that I usually have to listen to a lot of YouTube videos. In fact, my computer was down for a couple of days. I had a blown out power supply. So uh, here we are. This is going to be a fresh, spontaneous exploration of the world of Bob Nichols. <laughs> Well, it's really good to um, be able to um, to have this interview. Um, very happy to do it. Good. Um, as far as Bob's personal life, it's um, actually pretty ordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, I was an, an adventurous person when I was young, and um, and just loved adventure. I sailed all over the world. Nice. And and didn't really go to work until I was about 40 <laughs> and uh, although there was a lot of work of course involved on the boats and, and, right. and that but um, then at that time I went back to school got current in electronics mm -hmm. and went to work for Hughes Aircraft hmm. uh, working on flight simulators for about eight years and um, you know just Moved from there over to a, a brewery and worked for them for about eight years huh. in, in management. In, in the, hey, you weren't a taster. No, I wasn't a taster. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, I was the guy that would come and and, uh, and put the recipe into the computer because we couldn't test, trust the tasters to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> and uh, so you worked for a brewery for about eight years. Right. And I guess, and then I had a stroke in 1997, and yeah. I retired at that time. Wow. Um, so where does the whole spiritual odyssey come into the story? Well, that runs parallel to the work odyssey. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a very good friend, a dear friend here in Ojai, uh, a fellow by the name of Dr. John Nassie, who's mm -hmm. been a personal friend since the late 60s. Mm -hmm. And he'd always been the one that was interested in spirituality. I wasn't right. uh, that much, but I would go to advance with him, and I was always the, the skeptic, you know, the mm -hmm. practical, you know, realist. So right. To speak. And, uh, and it wasn't until the stroke that I sought him out, and at that time he was showing uh, Gangaji tapes to, to mm -hmm. groups here every Wednesday night, and I started watching the tapes, and it became very clear to me that there was something going on with this self-inquiry. Right. And I can remember just w being willing for self-inquiry to happen. It mm -hmm. wasn't all about vigilance, as Gangaji and, and Ramana talk about, or, or, um, or earnestness that, that Nisargadatta talks about. It was more just a willingness to take a look. Huh. And in the, out of this willingness, I found that I was getting happier and happier and happier, and pretty soon I was one of these bliss bunnies that you see running around. And of course, I thought this meant something really important about me. I, I thought, well, wow, I've really arrived. I'm enlightened. And oh, yeah. I would go to every satsang, regardless of who was giving them, and uh, sit up in the front row and stare at the guru, uh, <laughs> demanding, demanding my recognition that that I, I, I had arrived. Uh, yeah. And uh, what was this taking, what did this taking a look um, amount to that had brought you to this condition? Well, like I say, it was more the willingness than, than the mechanics. But what it looked like, it was actually self-inquiry was very, uh, very confusing for me in the mm -hmm. beginning. Because I expected some answer, I thought that I was going to trade my identity in, you know, from being Captain Bob to to Enlightened Bob. Yeah. And that there would be some kind of event that would precipitate that. But it wasn't really 
an event. It was just I got very happy. Huh. So you're yeah. just put, were putting your attention on spirituality, you know, going to satsangs and watching videos and stuff, and somehow just that new orientation in your life brought greater happiness. It wasn't that there was any specific practice that you engaged in or anything. No, just any time that I was, uh, you know, that some emotion would come up, some momentarily emotion would come up, I would chase it back to its source. Ah. It was really easy to do because the source seemed to be, you know, the ha the, the, the the blissful state. Mm. Okay. So you were sort of, I suppose we could say more self-referral or introspective or, or something than you had been most of your life when you probably just were outer directed and doing whatever yeah. you were doing. There, there was right. a, the attention was turning within. Right. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely, except for a brief stint with, uh, with uh, Werner Earhart back in the 70s and, and, and some transcendental meditation mm -hmm. there again in the, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty much virgin ground here. Okay. How long did you do Werner Earhart or TM? Well, I actually got it. I did TM for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and then I just, it just seemed like there was no difference between what was going on with my eyes closed sitting in a posture than what was going on outside. Okay. So it, it seemed, and at that point, the practice dropped itself. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't say that you had awoken or anything at that point back in the 70s. Right. It was more like you just didn't notice yeah. any contrast anymore between meditation and activity. Well, I had another peak experience uh, in the process of doing the S training in 1976. Mm -hmm. And for, oh, about two weeks there, I would look all over the place, and I, all I saw was myself. Wow. It so you, pretty, you had some stuff fun. cooking pretty early on then. Right. Well, even at 19, I, there was a discovery of myself as, uh, as pure witnessing. Mm -hmm. But I was so busy with school and everything else that got put on the back burner it, it didn't stick right and none mm. of these experiences seem to stick right it happened for a couple so, of weeks and then they go away right or even six months like with the bliss mm -hmm. when i was in the bliss experience it was it was it got to the point where it, the mind was saying when does this become an indulgence yeah and it became thick and syrupy and it was <laughs> like the, the ego felt that it had to maintain it and defend it Hmm. So there's still, the, the inquiry still wasn't deep enough, and it was almost like the mind was giving me something so that it could stay in charge, so that it could remain the spiritual director, the one that, that, uh, that was managing the bliss, managing the uh, clarity. Hmm. That. You probably know from all your time in India that even bliss is considered to be one of the sheaths or koshas that yes, Ananda Maya kosha, kosha right? right. It, it yeah. occludes the self even, and, yeah. and it can be a very alluring one, you know, because it's so nice. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people, you know, keep saying I lost it, and then they go back and they try and recreate that that circum, you know, the circumstances, and they meditate their tails off. Right. You know, trying to regain something that's perceived to have been lost. Mm -hmm. um, the truth that one is can't be lost. Right. And it's very ordinary. Yeah. You know, the experiences that are associated with it can run the full gamut of experience, but that which one is never moves and never changes. Mm -hmm. And Ramana's only real admonition or teaching was just simply be still, be as you are. Everything else was just an advocacy of um, of, uh, of self inquiry, and and then he would you know help people with their sadhana. He never discouraged people from whatever sadhana they found themselves engaged in. Right. He felt everything was unfolding. I'm sure he felt just everything is unfolding exactly as it should mm -hmm. here in samsara, but that which we are isn't doing anything. There's no unfolding. There's just this. Right. So here you were back in the late 90s, going to all the gurus and sitting in the front row and gleaming at them and uh, saying, hey, look at me, aren't I cool? And so how, how did you kind of move beyond that phase? Well, I met a fellow by the name of, he goes by the name now of, uh, 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 well, he was given the name Ramana by Papaji, mm -hmm. uh, a Japanese-American fellow. And oh, he, yeah, yeah, he came to uh, yeah. my town, yep. Mm -hmm. C.Y. Ramana, and he was mm -hmm. basically... Uh, doing a radical awakening process with people. Yeah. And the way I presented to him, it was actually in a weekend retreat, um, I 
at, at that time, I weighed about 260 pounds, and I was in the gym three days a week. So huh. I was a lot, lot different uh, physical look than... Yeah, than so, so it was and all was, muscle, huh? Yeah, I was full of energy, yeah. Cool. And, and, uh, and the, that energy, as I said earlier, was sometimes being spent defending that bliss state. If any circumstance in life threatened it, I was feeling an upwelling of extreme anger. Huh. And I thought, this is dangerous because I've never had really uncontrollable anger in my life. I've always, had always pr pr prior to that, kept a pretty tight rein on myself, hmm. uh, you know, in that, in that area. And that goes back to Freudian stuff, you know, and having an angry father and swearing I'd never be like him and all yeah. the stuff that we usually do handling our archetypical relationships. Um, so I was very concerned. Anyway, we did the process, which is a, a guided visual self-inquiry, you know, and part of it was using him as a mirror, mm -hmm. his eyes as a mirror for the seeing that's happening through this body. Um, and there was an explosive thing when, it, when he asked me to, to see my seeing reflected back into myself, and it's, you know, the, there's a whole setup to this process, and he's very good at, at it. Um, it was like there was an explosion. When I looked back, I saw, just for an instant, you know, very terrifying, actually. You know, just it's kind of like where they or, or wherever, wherever, like black was invented. It was darker than black. It was huh. deep. It was, it was just, you know, I guess people would call it, if you were going to label it, it would be the void. Um, and in that moment, it was just like the whole back of my head blew off. It was, Interesting. It was, ex it was explosive. Hmm. And I went home that evening, and the bliss was gone. Hmm. What was here was just this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could describe it using words or try to, but it's just, the, I guess in the Bible they call it the peace beyond all understanding. Hmm. And that hasn't really, it's never changed. Isn't there so, also some phrase in Sufism or someplace about the terrifying dark or some, some such phrase? Have you heard that? I haven't. Uh, it, I was just listening to a Sufi guy the other day, and he was giving this talk, and he was saying how you know, people are always trying to run away from that, but in fact that's where the, yeah. what we should dive into. And, exactly. uh, I'm, sorry, I'm afraid I can't do justice to it, but your experience reminded me of that. Yeah, Papaji used to say, just take a half step back into yourself. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered why, why a half step, and then I realized there's no place for your foot to fall. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, so that was like late 90s or something. Uh, was, yes. Yeah, yeah. not probably, that dates matter, but just out of probably curiosity. Probably 98, yeah. Right. And then there were other teachers after that. Compassion showed up, uh, you know, in, with one teacher... Uh, just it just it was almost like the whole thing's been choreographed ever since mm. the stroke. You know, just the right teacher showed up at the right time. What do you mean the compassion showed up? Well, I was at a retreat with a, a, a weekend retreat on the. I think we were doing the Lankavatara Sutra mm -hmm. uh, with a lady named Shanti Mai. Have you done her uh, yet? I've I've heard of her. Yeah. Right, and uh, people were late. Uh, somebody was late, so she decided that we'd all do the Gayatri Mantra, which mm -hmm. I'd never heard of or done before. And we did it for about 45 minutes, and then she said, well, now send that energy out to someone who needs it. And mm -hmm. I knew several people who were in pretty dire straits, and it, and it, it just seemed like it, there was an upwelling. Every time I breathed, you know, it was like the big jets of energy were coming out of my chest and I was mm. in tears of course and I asked her I said what the heck was that <laughs> and, and she looked at me and she just has grinned almost smirked and she says oh compassion happens wow yeah. huh. I realized that it isn't my compassion it isn't Bob's compassion the compassion comes through us love comes through you know these bodies what we normally take ourselves to be yeah, we're like vehicles or instruments. Uh, exactly. Yeah. That's that's interesting. There's a couple of interesting things that come to mind. Um, 
One is the fact that having had a stroke was not a deterrent or an impediment or an obstacle to having an awakening, which might be encouraging for some people because some people feel like your, your neurophysiology has to be functioning just perfectly in order for awakening to occur. Uh, but there are many... Mine, mine obviously isn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> or to be sustained, you know, and in both cases you're doing, you're doing okay on that, on that front yeah. despite some physical challenges. Yeah. Um, and yeah. another is, I'm sorry, go ahead, you were going to say something? Sustaining really isn't a question because, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it isn't, it isn't an issue. Uh, you know, the, this, this isn't happening in time. Yeah, yeah. You know, this, this is happening now. Mm -hmm. And recently, I've, it's become very clear that now is not a moment in time. Mm -hmm. Now is not just a little slice of eternity. It's always now. And time yeah. has its, uh, it, you know, time, space, causation, everything ha has its an, it appearance in now. Mm -hmm. And right now... And now it isn't some place to be here that I, you know, you know, quotation marks, need to be here and here in. <laughs> in other words, I don't need to be here now. I'm now itself. And yeah. There's a great certainty of this, and I am the now itself without saying the word now. Mm -hmm. And I'm now without and every and everything that now contains. Right. Some people use the word presence, uh, which right. I, you know, as a nice synonym for now. You know, it's just yes, this. Exactly. It implies kind of right. solid, perpetual. Not well, but yeah, I could say perpetual. Just sort of like continuum of yeah. presence. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now is a is a great synonym. And finally, we 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 take all. It's fun that it's fun that we wrestle with these sim, with this symbology with these words. Right. It's somehow or another that the words contain the truth. No, now is the truth. Words are 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 feeble attempt at at trying to point to it. Mm. The words aren't the truth. The words point to the truth. The Sailor, can't, the go words ahead. can't be the truth because they're they're symbols. Yeah, exactly. The symbols, concepts, and so on. Yeah. I mean, and and they're pretty poor. Um, symbols at that in most cases i mean mm -hmm. just take take a common experience take the color red you know you and i could sit here for the next hour trying to put that into words and everybody knows what red is but our words would utterly fail at, at really conveying any sense of what red is you know we, we could use synonyms we could talk about apples and and you know fire and whatnot but we, we're only just you know playing around with concepts yeah exactly <laughs> uh, yeah Exactly. It's just conceptual. You know, Nis Argadatas, you know, in the end, I think the final Gene Dunn book chronicles it. He, he finally he had admitted what he was up to in all of the satsangs, and he was there to destroy every, sats every, every, um, every concept that rose you mm. know, anywhere in the room. You know, his job was to destroy it, you know, and then bring us back to the, a non-conceptual scene. Yeah, and ironically, he must have been doing that through concepts because if he's speaking words, he's using concepts. Uh, but as they say, it takes a thorn to remove a thorn. Exactly. <laughs> I remember uh, reading in, in I Am That, <clears throat> one fellow uh, had had enough of it, and he said, words, 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 are we children to be fed words? And Miss Argada fired right back, as long as you believe words are important to your children. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> huh. So yet I do yet I do ninety minute talks, you know. I mean Yeah. And uh, and it's words, words, words. What else are you gonna do? Sit yeah. there and stare at them? <laughs> this whole thing's very paradoxical. <laughs> it is, it yeah. is. Uh and I love that word, as I've often said during interviews, and if you can really sort of become comfortable with paradox, then you don't kind of get fanatical about anything you know you or fundamentalist about anything and don't you don't insist that things happen have to be any particular way yeah. this whole idea of arriving that somehow mm -hmm. we're going to arrive at, at some permanent state where it's a different than the way it is now mm -hmm. um, is uh, unfortunate yeah except speaking of paradox mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand that does happen in a sense you yeah. know well, there are events. 
Yeah. Yeah, it did happen. But I can say that even after the Radical Awakening event, that there was still a, and there still is an unfolding here. Mm -hmm. That it it doesn't seem nothing's been attained. Some, but but there's more. Uh, there's a clear recognition of self everywhere. I mean, you know. Yeah. There's this Zen saying: uh, "Always being, always becoming." Right. Um, which to my mind means, you know, like, you know, that everybody's very popular these days to say stop seeking, give up seeking, you know, and one can settle into a state in which one can honestly say seeking has stopped, and yet at the same time, discovery doesn't stop, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, there's, you know, when Ramana was asked to, how long one should, should practice self-inquiry mm -hmm. he said until there's no one left to inquire yeah even more pointedly he was asked uh, when was he going to stop self-inquiry and he said uh, er, er, the inquiry mm -hmm. and he said until this body's last breath yeah so finally one can live as a question mm -hmm. and not and it doesn't take anything away from the certainty that what that that arises that one is is that which is now it, which which is context it's not concept or content although it contains everything uh, that we're simply here in, in this very ordinarily yeah a, a living life as a question because there's a whole lot we don't know you know, religion is full of beliefs. The metaphysical is full of belief. There's a lot of pseudoscience out there, you know, posing as science, you know, trying to, to, I guess, claim an understanding of, of what's going on here. But right. for me, the whole, the whole thing is still a mystery. It's and, interesting. I f yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, Oh, that's enough. You know, oh. History pretty well says it. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say I find it interesting that in the last sentence you used both the word certainty and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and you used it in such a way as to make it clear that in, in some respect you, you are resting in, a, in certainty. And at the same time, again, paradoxically, uh, there's this kind of continual kind of uncertainty which mm -hmm. is... I find a very healthy uh, juxtaposition in yeah. in one life. It keeps you honest, and and, and it, it keeps you from look, going around looking, you know, considering yourself to be special, and, <laughs> and running around collecting devotees, you know, which will give you reinforcement of how special you are. Yeah. And, you know the the, the classic enlightenment sickness. You know? Yeah. Although to the defense of some people who perhaps are worthy of having devotees, I would say it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, uh, you know, an uh, uh, unhealthy condition. You know, Ramana Maharshi had devotees. It probably didn't go to his head. No, yeah, <laughs> probably didn't. But then he was, you know, he basically, you know, talked about the difference between the quote-unquote outer and inner guru, which of course is only you know the words outer and inner are only relative to the the fact that we consider the limit of who we are as the skin so to speak or maybe mm -hmm. a little aura that's 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 radiating around us yeah these bodies mm -hmm. um, but he basically said that the the outer guru was temporary and the whole idea was for the outer guru to push the push push the attention within uh, and then the inner guru or the sat guru would take over the right sat guru is forever the the outer guru is a, just a temporary appearance in in these lives and even i presume our, I'm, I'm sorry go ahead yeah, even even our parents are temporary appearances. sure and i presume that when he referred to inner guru he was not referring to you know, discovering Ramana within yourself. He was just discovering within yourself that which Ramana is, and we are, and the, yeah. and everything is. Yeah, I've heard the word Ramana, you know, defined as as, as simply that which is, is lives in the heart of all being. Mm. Yeah. 
I can't nice. remember where we I read that. I read it somewhere, and I thought it was right on. <laughs> mm. So, uh, you know, a, f a few minutes ago we were talking about the, uh, you know, the fact that physical challenges haven't um, been a, an obstacle really for you in, in having this realization and, and, and sustaining it. Um, let's explore that just a little bit more. I mean, Ramana and Nisargadatta both died of cancer, you know, mm -hmm. and presumably that uh, even in the final throes of that, it didn't disrupt their inner realization. I say presumably because I don't know, you know. Um, and it, it, it seems that on the one hand, um, we need a body in order for this to be a living reality. Otherwise, if without a body, there is just well, a cat's tail walking past. <laughs> without a body, uh, you know, there's just that, that being or, or that presence, uh, but, but there's nothing living it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so I guess the I guess the question is, how intact does that body have to be for this to be a living reality? Well, I think that it, one is very fortunate if one can discover the truth of now mm -hmm. uh, before one gets sick. You know, yeah. I think that's a huge boon. But you didn't. I mean, you had had a stroke already. Yeah, I had a stroke, uh, but I was rec I recovered fairly well from that. I had a little aphasia, you know. Minor stroke. It wasn't yeah, a big yeah, major one. It wasn't one. a huge major stroke. Right. In fact, uh, I can remember driving up from all the way up to Mill Valley I, I, uh, to see Gangaji, mm -hmm. and it was it was you know a pretty good sized meeting and she at the beginning of the meeting she says well those of you who are first timers raise your hand so we mm -hmm. did and mm -hmm. she made, made a mental note I guess of, 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 of who we all were and I had a whole story in my head I'd come up there to thank her for the videotapes to thank mm -hmm. her for you know the contribution she'd made over here you know in this live stream yeah and uh, Phil was a gentlemanly thing to do <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a whole story about the stroke and how it was really, you know, great that to have this teaching while I was while the recovery was taking place. And wouldn't you know it, this fellow came up in a wheelchair right before me, who had had a stroke, uh -huh. a major, major stroke. The guy, yeah. he looked at his eyes; he was on fire yeah. know, with love. Huh. He, they wheeled him, they got him up on the stage, and he told the exact story <laughs> that I had concocted in my brain. You know, stole your thunder entirely, yeah? Huh? Stole it completely, and I'm sitting there, and then she looked over, he was finished, she looked over at me and says, well, next, and I says, no, <laughs> I couldn't do it. So it was about a year later in a private meeting that I actually got a chance to thank her for the, uh, uh. For the uh, contribution. You know, and, the, and just for being here. So yeah, yeah, she she's very sweet. I really like her. I, I yeah. interviewed her a while back, and then I met her at the Science and Non-Duality Conference yeah. a cu couple of months ago, and she was just so gracious. Um, just really. Yeah. Well, I love all my teachers. I'm certainly not the sharpest pencil in the drawer. I never could have figured this out on my own. That's for huh. sure. I would never have known how to look. You know, so I'm very grateful. Yeah. There are all these uh, forms that show up, and I realize they're all my own self, and they're all just my projection, and all of the Advaita talk and everything. But that doesn't stop the gratitude. Yeah, and yeah. as I don't think it should. Um, and you know, we're all like, kind of like little candles lighting each other or something. You know, even though all the candles are made of wax, some perhaps could use a little fire to get the wax burning or right uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. so you spent a lot of time in India I, I I glanced at your website and it said you were more or less commuting back and forth for yeah. quite a while hanging out in Tiruvannamalai um, anything noteworthy to say about that uh, yeah I, I just love I just love it there uh, mm -hmm. I was there off season I built a house over there was building oh. finishing touches on a house Wow. And I went there during the hot season, and that's when the cancer came back with a vengeance this year. Mm. Um, and I got very ill, and, and when I came back at the, uh, I guess, the end of July, <laughs> um, I was 
pretty sick. But um, I love it there. I, I my my preference is to be there if the doctors tell me that uh, um, that you could be that, that well that there's nothing more they can do for me. If we've you know yeah. explored every avenue, I'll probably go back there to let nature take its course. Huh. I we were we were talking uh, uh, about the illness. Uh, with, when one's in service to the model that we have in our head of who we are, um, anytime something threatens what that looks like, that model, that idea of who we are, um, it's almost like even minor things. Bec you know, and I can remember uh, it would be like. Everything was a matter of life and death. You know, this is a matter of life and death. That's a matter of life and death. Getting here, getting started on time. Matter of life and death. You know, it was, it was like this whole concocted idea of who I am was at stake somehow or another. Mm -hmm. um, well, people go in and shoot up their o the office because they lost their job or something. You know, they, they right. just make these radical moves over trivia. When this self knowledge arises, and it is an, it is a knowingness, it's mm -hmm. not an experience. Right. Uh, it seems like that we can look at birth and death as just events that happen in, within the context of life, mm -hmm. and and those are the probably the two moment most momentous events that happen in a life, and they're just events, and we can live our lives in fear of coming events or in anticipation of coming, you know, the, the, the anticipation of a good event that's about to happen. And to the degree that we get caught up in that, in other words, to the point where it blinds us to what's going on now, uh, we kind of miss out on mm -hmm. the juice that's available here and now. Yeah. So it is possible not to live in fear but the only way to really do it that I found is simply to abide as the self right here and now. Mm -hmm. And of course, once it is seen, there's really no effort required for that to be what's so. Yeah, and the operant phrase there is once it is seen, you know, because obviously the vast majority of humanity have seen it. And so they're very much caught up in the drama. Um, and, you know, most people, I suppose, if they were in your circumstances, would be feeling a lot of fear and remorse and sadness and all kinds of things would they be going through. Uh, but you seem to have a pretty balanced, um, a lot of equanimity about it all. Yeah. Well, these, you know, these, you know, I still have a full spectrum of emotions. Mm -hmm. not, this doesn't turn you into a zombie. No. Those feelings and, and, and thoughts and all of that arise, mm -hmm. but that which they're in service to, that, you know, the idea of me is seen to be just an, an appearance, but it's like a ghost, you know, it's a ghost in the machine. It's not really who I am. Yeah, and it seems to me that you know, sure, you have the natural range of human emotions, but it seems to me that they must have much less gravitas, you know, much less gripping quality as a result of this perspective yeah. that you have. There's a lot less momentum behind them. Yeah. They don't carry you away. They don't, care, they don't seem to carry me away. I experience them fully, you know, in the moment. And there again, it's not a strategy. They, they are experienced fully, and then they just flash off. Mm -hmm. And I'm here, which is... Which I've always been, you know. So it's it's like a little storm or a little squall happening on the ocean. It really doesn't affect the ocean. The waves may pile up for a little while and, and look very tumultuous. But if one were in a submarine and just dove down 200 feet, you'd never even know what was going on on the surface. Yeah. yeah. And do you find that um, when the waves churn up a bit? Um, they take over for a little while, or is it always that the depth of the ocean is there kind of in, in addition to yeah. the waves? This knowingness is here. Yeah, it doesn't get obscured yeah. by the waves. Right. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. So, you know, I would say, and, and I'm not, I mean, the circumstances in my life are relatively 
undramatic compared to yours. <laughs> in terms of, you know, oh yeah, I've heard a lot of good drama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I would say that that is a radically different um, perspective than the average person would have, and is um, a great blessing uh, among other things. Uh, but it, it it seems to me it would just deflate about ninety nine percent of the fear that one would otherwise feel if one were, you know, just locked exclusively into the notion of oneself as a mere individual. Yeah, yeah. That's why this must be shared. You know. Yeah, exactly. In uh, in August, when I you know finally got my scans back, um, doctor said, "Well, it looks like maybe you got six months." Mm -hmm. And and he, and that that was a bit of a wake up call. I says, well, uh, perhaps I need to share this. And it just as as life would have it, Mark showed back up in my life, uh -huh. and he's this dynamic guy. Yeah. And none of this, none of these thought songs would be happening without his presence. He's mm. doing the computers. He's do, doing the website. He's doing everything. I just, oh, that's great. He just, he just props me up in front of the room and I run the <laughs> pulls the string on your back <laughs> and. <laughs> off I go, you know. Yeah. So, so, um, and you know, he's and and you know, the website, you know, is of course. Uh, um, Bob Nichols dot com and yeah, it's, I'll be linking yeah. to that from mine and yeah, right. be, yeah. yeah, great, yeah, because it's uh, we've got a lot of YouTube videos up, you know, mm -hmm. little little clips of uh, from Sod Song and from interviews, and uh, and then all also the schedule is is there, you know, as much as we can schedule events now, we're going to sure. continue to do so. For mm -hmm. as long as I don't fall over when he pops me up in front of the room. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, you know the Hare Krishna people. I went to their uh, center in Detroit one time. They had a nice restaurant there, and you go into a different room, and they had a life-size mechanical model of the of AC Bhakti Vedanta sitting there, and it turned its head and looked at you when you walked in. And <laughs> so maybe Mark can work something like that out. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> um, well, I think it's, you know, there's all these voices out there these days. There's so many teachers, and, and a lot of them are quite young. Uh, and s sometimes they can seem a little glib, you know, because it's like they haven't necessarily been through uh, all of life's vicissitudes, and they're talking about non-duality and saying all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And But, I you know, I feel like each person has their contribution, and it's valuable. And, and whoever, you know, you, people gravitate to whoever resonates with them. Um, and, you know, I think your your contribution is in some ways unique and and really valuable and i think it's great you're doing what you're doing because i mean it's it's we're all you know no one gets out of here alive as they say and uh and no, it's very no body right no body, no body. You're right, gets out of here. <laughs> and it's it's great to hear someone who is you know facing his mortality more Im immediately than most of us uh who is still like you know blissful and uh confident and you know grounded in in oneness and f forgive me if I'm using the wrong terms but just you know speaking that truth uh, I think it's good for every good for people to hear yeah well I think I think it's great that there are young people giving sad song and yeah yeah of course they don't uh, maybe have a lot of experience you know life experience yet but that will come it will and I would love to see a day that on a Sunday morning or there'd be as many people giving sad song in this country as there are Giving sermons in the in the in the various churches and temples. Yeah, um, I I think this knowledge should be in the schools. I think mm -hmm. we should be teaching children from an early age. You know, that uh, you know fostering self inquiry at at, at, a, at a very early age. I see a quickening. I see the possibility that uh, that this whole thing could reach critical mass someday, and that everybody would just wake up together. And if we were to see each other constantly, we see ourselves in each other's eyes. Mm -hmm. I think we need. I think a lot of the laws would no longer be necessary. Yeah, and we'd cooperate and we'd transcend all of this nationalism, and we'd actually start working together. You know, to create. Uh, you know. A. A, a unified approach to 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 the problems that are plaguing that seem to be plaguing us now, and I think a lot of the problems would just dissolve. I don't even think they'd have to be solved. Yeah, that's very well put, and, I, I, and it's interesting you should say that because a lot of teachers, 
uh, seem to say that there's no sort of practical implication to this realization. There's no sort of mundane significance to it. Um, and I tend to disagree. I mean, I think that we structure our entire society from top to bottom based upon the level of consciousness we're living, whatever terminology you want to use. And, you know, what you're suggesting is that, you know, living oneness or living, you know, self-realized state would have practical implications on all levels, even economics and, you know, politics and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's... Yeah, as a philosophy, you know, we, we you know, I mean, I, 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 I get a kick sometimes going to some of the Dwight uh, blogs or websites, and mm -hmm. you'll see these guys in the name of, of non-dualism, they'll be attacking each other. Yeah, they'll fighting like cats and dogs. <laughs> completely ad hominem on each other, you know, yeah. and, and um, which is probably the worst fallacious argument if you were going to have a debate. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's kind of funny you know as a philosophy it's kind of I guess there's some value to it but as a living is the living truth it's uh, it's not even a matter of value and quality it's just what's so and and coming from what's so is you know there's possibility there's a possibility for for all of this these self-generated problems you know and self I'm talking about I guess I hate to use the term, but with the small s, the ego-generated mm -hmm. problems, and ego at the level of, of race, ego at the level of sexual sexual identity, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, uh, uh, in, in a man or a woman's body, um, the whole liberal conservative thing, it's just all, it's all self-generated uh, divisiveness that really doesn't, doesn't doesn't need to be happening, mm -hmm. you know. In the light of who we who we really are, we could we could actually raise our arguments uh, a little bit to a different yeah. level. It's interesting that you should you know point out the the little cat fights that take place on the some of the non duality blogs, and it it points to a theme I often bring up, which is a I I believe there's a sort of a tendency these days for people to gain an, an kind of an intellectual or intuitive familiarity with non-duality uh, and then mistake that for the actual living of it and if and then if, if that's all you've got is the intellectual thing without the living of it then then th there can very easily be a kind of a fundamentalist uh, attitude or perspective which causes uh, altercations and arguments and right. you know now, uh, what ha happens is uh, a new orthodoxy gets built. You know, yeah. You know, and it, it, I, I looked up the word orthodox in the dictionary, and it mm -hmm. simply means having the correct opinion. Right, right. <laughs> and a heretic, of course, is uh, one who seems to have the right to choose. Mm. You know, How interesting. Maintains the right to choose. Hmm. But it's, it's almost impossible. You know, that's the problem with, with sticking, you know, a, le a, a guru above you. And it, there's a possibility that new orthodoxy will form, and then, and then the whole the spontaneity goes out of it. Yeah, and you see that even in in groups that are founded by people whom I would regard as genuine gurus. You know, the 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 followers or the you know the people in the group tend to get into all kinds of you know fundamentalist and hierarchical and petty ways of behavior. Um, and there's not not much that the the guru can do about it sometimes just although some of them are more effective than others but there's always this sort of a politics that comes into it you know and then if the if the if the guru themselves starts becoming an, an iconoclast in other mm -hmm. words starts poking friend you know poking at the other ways of looking at things mm -hmm. uh it um it can it gets worse, you know. You yeah. Know, the religious wars even you know, uh -huh. fade out of that. Yeah, sounds like we both speak from a little bit of experience with this sort of thing, mm -hmm. firsthand. Yeah. Huh. Well, um, what sh what haven't we talked about that um, you know uh, that you like to talk about in your sot songs that you know mm -hmm. you typically say to people? Uh, are we missing anything here? Well, we're not missing a lot. Um, the only th I just keep saying, just be, be who you are. Be still. Be who you are. Mm -hmm. um, 
this a fellow by the name of Carl Rentz. Uh, oh, yeah. Thanks said it very well. I, I, I used to, I watched his thought songs in Tier of Anomaly up, mm -hmm. up until a couple of years ago. He was, he, he drew huge crowds there. Mm -hmm. And some of his one liners were pretty good. Uh, he said, uh, be what you cannot not be. <laughs> uh, of yeah. course, if you, can not, you cannot not be it, no effort is required. <clears throat> however, but, however, yeah. Yeah, however good. in the beginning, in this experience, effort is required. Mm -hmm. Personal effort is required. Is required. Uh, Ramana Maharshi was asked one time, well, isn't the ego being asked to, you know, inquire or delve into its own roots, into its own identity? And Ramana said, admittedly so. But then he brought out the analogy of the, you know, the, the stick being used to stir the funeral pyre. Yeah. Uh, you know, evidently referring to the ego. Mm -hmm. And eventually the stick burns along with the rest. Oh, that's a good analogy. Yeah, I like that. Right. Huh. So uh, he said that effort is required until it can no longer be maintained. Not till mm -hmm. it's a good idea to stop the effort, until the effort just drops away on its own. Yeah, it just turns to ashes. And then after that, no matter how one would effort, you know, you, you find that you just can't, you can't, that effort isn't required and it isn't even possible mm -hmm. in this arena. And then one just simply abides as that. And at that time, it seems, although this seems like it's pro uh, progressive in time, and I guess it is, uh, when looked at from outside, uh, there's, no, there's no possibility of efforting and, right. and a certainty shows up, but it isn't a certainty about anything in particular. Right. It's just, there's just certainty that just, it just starts building, and that happens very slowly in, in this experience. Mm -hmm. And then finally it's unshakable, and there's this solid knowingness. It's not an experience. It's not something else that one is experiencing. It's and I think somebody coined the word a few years ago called imperience. It's not even that. Hmm. Uh, it's it's just this it's just this raw, you know, but not raw in the point of being irritable. Just uncooked uh, knowingness. Mm -hmm. And there again, whales words fail. Yeah, but if people are having that to any degree of clarity, they'll know what you're talking about. And and if they aren't, then I think hearing it. Um, it helps to enliven it to some extent, you know. And in fact, I was going to say, you know, to, do you feel that um, a lot of times when you're sitting saying just abide as the self or whatever, it, it, it falls on deaf ears? Or do you feel that somehow sitting in a satsang and hearing that sort of thing enough times and, and with enough, cl you know, from someone who's speaking with enough clarity helps to sort of um, inculcate that mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in the listeners, uh, awaken that in the listeners? Well, it's it's a great privilege to be able to sit in the front of the room and look in the eyes of everybody, you know, out in front of, you know, what a privilege it is. And mm -hmm. you can see in these thought songs that almost everyone, I mean, you'll see a few frowns here and there in the mind, you know, that the mind is doing its, uh, yeah, but, yeah. It's, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the doubt. The doubt. Mm -hmm. I, I sometimes say that the only, between, the only thing between you and your, whoever I'm speaking to, uh, in full self-realization is just, is the ah buts. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if the ah buts drop away. Mm. And, and maybe you're, sitting you're in you're satsang. Simply, you're, you're simply left with yourself. Yeah. And maybe sitting in satsangs helps to uh, dissipate the ah buts. You know, it, it helps to, de uh, un to uh, decondition the mind from doing that habitually. Yes. Um, I went to, I mean, it was very fortunate for me that my ego wanted all this verification for my enlightenment when I was mm -hmm. in that bliss stage, mm -hmm. um, because um, I would drive 200 miles to go to a satsang. It, mm. it was when I had to be in satsang. I love satsang. 
Uh, it didn't matter to me who was giving Satsang. You were a junkie. I was a Satsang junkie. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and it's an addiction I highly recommend. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It didn't matter to me. You know, it, there was never one teacher. There were teachers that made huge contributions, but it was, you know, some of them were like fingers pointing at the moon. Mm -hmm. Other, you know, and and you know, it's a I, to me it would be have been a mistake to, to gotten distracted by the finger, you know, mm -hmm. and start worshiping the finger. Um, there were. Um, There were others, you know, who, who who didn't perform that function, but were equally valuable. Mm. Um, they, it was almost like I say in this life, very fortunate. It was like almost there was a choreographer. I don't believe in a choreographer. I want to make that clear. But it almost seemed like it was choreographed. The right person showed up at exactly the mm. right time. And as I said earlier, I would like to see satsang everywhere. Yeah. Miss Argadotta said something quite interesting. He said, don't, uh, if, if you see people need help or assistance, by all means give it. And then he said, don't wait until you're perfect. <laughs> In other to, words, don't. To, get, to give it, you mean? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Um, uh, see why Ramana put me up in front of my first group in 1998. I think I went, did it again and, and, 2000, and then it didn't happen again until 2004. People were asking for it, so I mm -hmm. it was always a response to a request. Yeah, it was never my own idea, but I could. It was, it, but it, when the request came, it was nothing that I, I could say no to. Hmm. It's impossible to refuse. That's interesting. Don't wait till you're perfect. Um, uh, you know, sometimes people grumble that there are too many half-baked teachers out there. You know, that were teaching prematurely. Um, but it's, it's, I, I'd say that as long as people are honest about it and don't claim to be the ultimate grand poobah of, of creation, you know, <laughs> and, you know, acknowledge that maybe there are some things that they're still getting clearer about or whatever, then they, they can make a, a, a great contribution. Like we're all kind of, well, it's like, you know, you go to, you go to kindergarten, you go to first grade, let's say, and you learn ABC and you come home and your little sister says, what did you learn? I said, well, this is A and this is B and this is C. And then, and then she says, well, what's next? And, she, and you say, well, I'll tell you tomorrow. Right. right. <laughs> Probably the most important thing is your own effort, your own willingness to put yourself in a in, in a position where the burning takes place, where you start mm. burning in your own juice, mm -hmm. uh, when you you know, and this will, <clears throat> you, it, you're, there's this willingness for 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 things to unfold the way they are apparently unfolding and the way they're going to unfold, mm -hmm. and to not flinch, not run from that. Uh, do you feel there's any danger of dilettantism if one is going to a thousand different satsangs, or do you, or you know, because some teachers say, well, dig one deep well, don't dig a whole lot of shallow wells, and then you'll really get water. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, you can make a good case for that if if what you're going for is just to feel good. Just to say, oh, well, this one gives me more shakti pot than that one, mm -hmm. and you're just going for the good f uh, feeling. Um, a lot of gur some gurus get, you know, I guess, probably quite a few if they're effective, get accused of being, uh, what would you say, mood makers. I think that was a phrase that was being used a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and then people would come and they'd get high off of it. Uh, for sure. Feeling the peace and 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 solid beingness that one is in satsang is 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 a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's unfortunate that we blow it off so quickly after the you know we walk out the door and we're wondering where the next place to eat is and where the next experience is. But it still does its work. You know, a yeah. seed, seed is being planted. In, in satsang, I think so. And, I think so. Uh, I would say it's 
you know, everybody has their own process. I'm not sure there's a particular right way for everyone. Mm. I think that the way it, it unfolds for you is the correct way for you. I think that's a good point. I and mean, I think it, for some people it might be completely appropriate for them to just be with one teacher and not go running all over the place. For others, I think it can be very valuable to, um, you know, take a more hybrid approach and yeah. go to and a lot. For, and for some people, you know, wherever they are, you know, it may be just sitting home at night and doing japa, you know, nama mm -hmm. japa for eight hours is the thing that they should be doing now. Yeah. Uh, really important, I think one should just relax and realize that everything is unfolding exactly as it should. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to something you said a few minutes ago, everything is unfolding. You said you didn't believe in a, I forget the word you used, like in an organizer or something that, that is actually orchestrating the events of the universe. Um, you're about to say something in response to that. You want to go ahead? Well, I was looking um, at it from a, you know, from a singular point of view, that mm -hmm. in each of our heads, uh, I think C.Y. Ramana calls it the spiritual advisor. The mind takes on many guises. You know, there's the familiar anal uh, metaphor of the uh, of the thief uh, pretending to be a policeman so he could get in and steal the uh, steal the the uh, the jewelry. And mm -hmm. in this case, the jewelry is peace. And the mind mm -hmm. doesn't want to in order to be in a job in its job it loves drama mm. it, it 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 loves it, it's kind of like a good politician if there's not a problem why uh, <laughs> we wouldn't need them right in, in the meantime we don't we wouldn't need all these egoic identities mm -hmm. and we wouldn't be in service to them as if they were ourselves mm. um, and we could just relax and, and, and follow Ramana's admonition to just to be still be as we are and we'll still find that the body will be doing the needful mm -hmm. just whatever comes up that needs to be done the body will will do it just out of the exigencies of the moment you know just what's necessary in the moment Maybe I misunderstood what you were saying earlier when you were saying of nothing uh, you know, lack there's no organizer but I mean to me, when we when we say things like, "Well, you know, this just happened at the right time," or, I, or "or what I'm experiencing is what I need to be experiencing now," and you know, and even even aside from that sort of thing, I mean, looking down at the at a cell under a microscope, you know, you just see this incredible tel intelligence functioning and structuring and co you know operating there, and I just get this feeling that everything is like this big ocean of not only being or presence but intelligence and that there's this this marvelous orchestration taking place and we're all just kind of little cogs in a great cosmic machine yeah i think you know that in the tendency once we see that is mm -hmm. it, is, is that we anthropomorphize it well and yeah so well, we might think of a there, there's a being there that, that that actually reasons and thinks yeah i'm not saying that no, yeah, and I and I know, and I can see that you're not, but I, no. I think it's an important distinction. No big old guy in the sky with a beard. Right. <laughs> and uh, I would have to imagine that guy. Now, if he showed up, I'd be the first one on my knees. Yeah. Yeah. That. that uh, in Hosanna, whatever. I'm not thinking that way. I'm just thinking every iota, every particle of of, of it's like there's this. It's we're we're fish in an ocean of of intelligence. It's not only yeah. consciousness, but there's this intelligence with organizing power inherent within it that structures this marvelous universe. Illusory as it may ultimately be, it is nonetheless you know incredibly mysterious and profound. You beautifully put. You know, mm. I mean, I. I'm not even going to comment on that. Cause <laughs> it was perfectly stated, and this is the mystery. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is the mystery, and, and I could anthropomorphize it or say, you know, just depending on where I am and you know what I know about this, you know, I could mm -hmm. say I, it's the sun, and we could worship the sun this week, you know, and we did yeah. for a long period of time mm -hmm. uh, in some areas. Um, just where. But it is a mystery. Yeah. And the only thing I really know, the only thing that I can argue is I am. Mm -hmm. You know, and if I were to say I am not, you'd say, aha, I got you. Who said that? <laughs>
<laughs> right. <laughs> he said, I am not. So it's it's quite obvious that that's the 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 one thing I think Miss Argadotta said the one that that this is our capital is this I am because mm -hmm. it's the least changing thing that's happening here. Yeah. However, in in Vedanta, you know, it's been said that uh, that I am is the first ignorance. Hmm. Can you elaborate on what they mean by that? Well, I'm not sure I know what they mean, but they're uh -huh. basically saying that I. I am is the way I see it. It's kind of a pregnant statement. Mm -hmm. um, the am is just crying out for a an object. You know, in the sentence I am, it's crying for an object. I am mm. what? Right. Right. In this inquiry, then you know, from I am, this inquiry can proceed. Well, then what am I? You know, it's 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 what we want to know. We we. It, it's a question. It's part of our natural curiosity. Mm -hmm. what, I, what am I, really? Good question. And and if you know, it's if if everything is one. I mean, if there really are no two ultimately in creation, then you know, I somehow must be that which is actually giving rise, manifesting the universe. You know, orchestrating the the rotation of the planets, creating tulips. You know, all that stuff. And I think perhaps a a, a, a direction for maturation would be, you know, initially there's that uh, realization of I am presence, you know, unshakable, it's not going anywhere. But then, you know, we were talking earlier about um, how perhaps there could be further exploration of the mystery. And maybe the direction of growth is in terms of somehow more subtle appreciation of that uh, intelligence quality that uh, seems to be inherent in in the in I am. You think? I mean, I'm rambling yeah. a little bit, but uh, well, you know, I've been rambling <laughs> all morning. Uh, the, uh, you know, they science mm -hmm. is a wonderful exploration. It is. Yeah, they've just uh, the CERN uh, super collider in in Switzerland right now. They're they're looking for the what they call the Higgs boson. Right. Yeah, the God particle. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you know, science is a wonderful tool for exploring this this whole thing. And scientific method is kind of the best thing we have for separating the wheat from the from the chaff, so to speak. Uh, I, yeah, Miss Argadotta advocated it. You know, just. Finally, this work in self-inquiry, this effort that you know happens at the beginning, is an individual effort. You know, because mm -hmm. you know we're coming from a sense of being separated and individuated from the rest of what we consider to be not me, and uh, the the possibility is to do it, it, it. You could do it in a scientific way. You could, and some of the greatest yeah. scientists are really mystics. You know, right. Yeah, and, and 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 theoretical physics is starting to look like uh, is starting to look very spiritual. It is. I I, talk, I, I attended that science and non-duality conference a couple of months ago, and there were several physicists who spoke there. But one of them gave a talk, you know, entitled "Is is science is the is consciousness the unified field?" And he, he kind of went deeply into the you know, what physics understands about the unified field and what mystics understand about consciousness, and made a very convincing case that they're talking about the same thing. Right. Yeah, earlier on, J. Krishnamurti and David Bohm had some interesting dialogues, similar mm -hmm. to what we're having, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Well, you and I are kind of just rambling, both of us now, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> about, yeah. you know, and people can read books about this kind of thing, and I'm sure that many people are interested in it, but um, maybe we should just wrap it up now. We've, I think we've covered a lot of good ground, and um, it's been kind of really, really interesting talking to you. I'm glad that Mark got in touch you have a you have a good uh, PR man there yes I do <laughs> yeah Mark Sawyer is the complete name by the way yes I know Mark a lot of credit <laughs> good um, so I will make a couple of co concluding remarks if I may um, f first of all I'll be I've been speaking with Bob Nichols and Nichols uh, actually no. Oh, nickel is not plural. I'm sorry. Right. S singular. Okay. Uh, we got to get that right. That's my identity, <laughs> right? <laughs> Very sorry. Yeah. Um, and I'll be linking to Bob's website from patgap.com. 
uh, and if you live in in California in the Ojai area, you can or Southern California, you can probably see Bob in person. And as I understand from your website, as long as your health allows, you're willing to travel someplace if people pay your your expenses. And do you also do satsangs over the phone or Skype or anything like that? We haven't explored that yet, but I can see from this morning's talk that it's it's absolutely a possibility. You know, yeah, it's just like sitting one to one with somebody. And right. I think John do Sherman's doing a lot of that these days. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, so there's that possibility. So anyway, you can go to Bob's site and you'll you know whatever he wants to announce about what he's going to be doing, you'll you'll see it there. And uh, on my site, um, there are several possibilities. Firstly, there are all the interviews I've ever done archived there, and new ones get put up each week. And if you'd like to be notified when new ones get put up, there's a little email thing you can sign up for to be notified. There's also a chat group there, which develops around each interview, and usually 100, 150 uh, messages or posts come in after every single interview I've, I do, and people get discussing what's been discussed in the interview. So that's there. Um, and sometimes the guest himself will come in. If somebody has a question for Bob, for instance, they might want to pose it there, and Bob could come in and answer it. Uh, there's also a podcast, so that if you like to listen to these things on your iPod while commuting or whatever, you can you can follow a link and sign up for that. So that's about it. There's also a donate button. I, I actually just uh, invested in a new computer because this one that I have has really been having some problems, and I, I need a faster one for all this video stuff. So if you feel like donating, there's a button there you can click, and th that would be appreciated. So that pretty much covers it. So thank you very much, Bob, uh, and good luck with your health. I hope you stay with us a long time. You're making a, a wonderful contribution. Um, if you don't, like, uh, you know, get in touch from the other side and tell me what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. Thank, thank you very much for, for inviting me. Yeah, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Very, very interesting man. Or non man. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> thanks. And so thanks to the listeners and viewers, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>